As Val said, I was, I was fortunate enough to know her for, for almost 20 years and to work with her closely for 10, and I know that I would be still learning from her today if she were alive. Clara was a red diaper baby, the daughter of an anarchist and a socialist, parents whose radicalism and fervor for workers' rights was very typical of working class Jewish immigrants of the time. She grew up in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles in the 1920s and, uh, and then during the Depression of the 30s. This was a neighborhood where everybody was a joiner. Everybody was in a, a, a sports team or some other kind of club. Everybody had a cause. And uh, she describes, Clara describes this culture beautifully in the first essay in her book, plug, <laughs> revolution she wrote. The optimism that Clara had then about, uh, about progress, about the ability to make things better never left her her whole life. But her optimism was uh, not just a personality trait. It was a result of the world that she observed around her, the events that she experienced as her parents and others of their generation fought the battles um, that we've talked about a little bit already tonight, um, battles that won things like the New Deal and the right to unionize, um, the right to unionize without getting shot in the back, thank you very much. Um, she saw that collective action could and did make a difference. So it was only logical that she would embrace the ideas of scientific socialism, which explains why revolutionary change made by and for the working class is not only desirable, but inevitable. In other words, her revolutionary opti optimism had a solid, rational basis. Following Marx and the other socialists who went before her, she understood that social behavior has laws of motion just in the same way that physical matter does. She saw that capitalism is not eternal. Like any form of social organization, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, which we are hopefully in. The first project I worked on with Clara was, was as Val said, a, a study group on Marx's volume of capital. And I don't remember Clara actually saying this, but looking back now, I think that that study group was one of the many things uh, that Clara initiated in the party in that awful reactionary decade of the 1980s um, to, to help us, to help us keep our footing. Those were the years of mourning in America, as Reagan said, but twilight for the unions. Um, the PATCO, the busting of the, the air traffic controllers union, all that, that stuff that went on you know, uh, through the Reagan-Bush years. Clara knew that in order to stay in it for the long haul, the comrades needed that fundamental grounding in what capitalism is, how it works, and how it contains within it the seeds of its own destruction, which is us. Um, but of course, what Clara is famous for, or in some circles infamous for, is that extra little something that she brought to socialism, and that, of course, is feminism. Clara's feminism came to her as naturally as did her socialism through her life experiences and what she saw happening in the world. Her genius and the reason we are here together having this particular May Day celebration was to apply Marxist analysis to these events to figure out what it meant for revolutionary politics that women were starting to enter the workforce in record numbers, that women all over the world were suffering the cruelest blows of capitalism, that women were the backbone of every social movement. Clara was not alone in, in undertaking this analysis. There were a group of women with her in the Socialist Workers' Party who were looking at these issues and talking about them. But Clara was the one 
who understood exactly how profound the implications were and made it her life's work to explain and to fight for the ideas of socialist feminism everywhere, in her own parties, in the mass movements, and certainly on the left, locally, nationally, and internationally. Socialist feminism is a rich theory, but its basic concepts are extremely simple. Because women's oppression is an absolute requirement for capitalism, I mean, think of capitalism trying to function without it, and, and is in fact a, a, a part of capitalism coming into existence in the first place, because of these reasons, feminism is a revolutionary question. Patriarchy is real. It is a facet of capitalism, and women will not win our liberation short of socialism. A change in the system that does away with the profit motive and makes humane human relations possible. So that's one side of the question. The other is that because it is the people who are most oppressed who make revolutions, women's leadership in fighting for socialism is crucial. And um, by leadership, I mean the good kind of political leadership, the kind that helps people achieve common goals, not the kind that we're more familiar with under this system. Women's leadership is a precious revolutionary resource that must be encouraged, promoted, and defended. That has to happen within socialist organizations, the labor movement, and the other movements. But another important way to do it is through autonomous women's groups like Radical Women, which Clara was key to founding. These ideas may be simple. They may seem reasonable enough, right? But they landed like a volley of cannonballs on the male-dominated left scene of the 1960s. And it's not as though they have become any less upsetting <laughs> to some, maybe many male radicals, and female radicals too, but we'll get to that over the years. I vividly remember uh, a meeting at Old Freeway Hall in the early or mid-1980s I was a, a relative to newbie in FSP at that time, and very much at the beginning of my education about Marx and Engels, Lenin and Trotsky, James P. Cannon, and the other great socialist thinkers and doers. FSP was hosting a forum <clears throat> with one or more international Trotskyists speaking. Um, the one I remember was a man named John Lister from the Workers' Socialist League in England. And um, this was a group uh, that believed, as many groups did and still do, that the women's movement is inherently petty bourgeois. Uh, because it has reformists as well as revolutionary, revolutionaries within it, and because women's oppression affects not only working class women, but all women. The thing I remember uh, is not the speeches from the distinguished personages at the front of the room, but Clara's mini-speech from the floor during discussion. <laughs> she gave an excellent short exposition of the FSP's ideas, and then she asked rhetorically, and why are FSP's ideas not taken seriously? Because most of us don't have penises. <laughs> it's one of those moments that sticks with you. But it's important to say, like Dennis did, that Clara's scorn for male leftists who were backward on what was called the woman question was equaled only for her support, uh, only by her support for male feminists and cultivation of their leadership. She believed that, first of all, feminism is for all of us. And secondly, that you can never have too many good leaders. The kind of analysis that Clara and her co-thinkers of the 50s and 60s were applying to women's conditions and social role, they were also applying to the conditions and social role of blacks in the United States. This led them to many of the same conclusions. 
For its survival, capitalism depends on racism as well as sexism, and that makes the fight against racism also an integral part of the fight for socialism and the leadership of people of color, a necessary ingredient for success. In the US, with its history of slavery and a second American Revolution, the Civil War, um, to end that awful institution, black leadership is especially critical. As W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. As it turns out, unfortunately, it is still the, also the problem of the 21st century. Socialist feminism is a philosophy that says, without the leadership of the most oppressed, the changes that we desperately need in our lives, and the changes that the world's majority who live on less than $2 a day desperately need in their lives, won't happen without this leadership. This was part of Trotsky's political message as well. And it puts women, people of color, LGBT people, immigrants, those who are disabled, whether by imperialist war or industrial accident, it puts people like these center stage in bringing about fundamental change. Most especially because of the triple whammy of class, sex, and race, it puts the leadership of working women of color center stage. Again, this is something that was not abstract for Clara, but that she experienced throughout her life, through her work in anti-poverty programs, the pioneering fight for abortion rights in Washington state, and in many other instances. Clara's notion of leadership was also a team concept. Yolanda Alaniz, in a piece uh, she wrote for the Freedom Socialist when Clara died, put it this way. She said that Clara led by creating leaders. Clara built a party that way after she and the entire Seattle branch of the Socialist Workers Party left over issues like revolutionary integration and feminism and founded the FSP in 1966. And the building of FSP was itself definitely a team effort. As Clara attempted to mold a group of new left, me generation activists into a group of serious, educated revolutionaries, a new generation of socialist leaders, she couldn't have done it without the co-leadership of Gloria Martin and Melba Windoffer, who were right there with her. Just as Clara had to fight for feminism in the socialist movement, she had to patiently explain and argue for the idea of a vanguard party in the feminist and other mass movements. She pointed to the examples of revolutions that succeeded, like the Russian Revolution, and revolutions that failed, like the Spanish Revolution, to make her case. In her series Socialism for Skeptics, she wrote, a transformed reality will not be concocted out of literary documents and good intentions and dreams of paradise, but out of mortals who build an instrument that is capable of organizing the overthrow of the existing government, the creation of a new structure, and the administration of a new course. Clara saw nothing to apologize for about the instrument capable of making people's best hopes and dreams reality. Um, you've already learned some of this history from Patrick. Uh, Clara was dead center in a lot of the political battles that she was part of. One of them was the campaign to bring women into the electrical trades at Seattle City Light. City Light hired Clara to do that. But management did not really want a bunch of tough, confident women invading the male bastion of the well-paying trades. They wanted to get an A for effort, but not give the electrical trades trainees actual jobs as the end result of the program. This double dealing on their part kicked off more than one legal and political battle including Clara's lawsuit against City Light after they fired her, which she won 
after about eight long years. Some of Clara's funniest and sharpest writings date from this period, particularly as she analyzed the role of what Trotsky called the middle caste. These are the people you think should be on your side, but really, no, they're not. The misleaders in the mass movements who are always ready to compromise with the enemy. You know, you give me your silence on abortion rights and I'll drop lesbianism, you know, etc. Um, these are the union leaders who don't want to strike against appalling conditions because it would embarrass the Democratic Party polit politicians. The, um, the female middle managers who only have their positions because of the feminist movement, thank you, but will throw other women under the bus at a moment's notice if those other women are too radical or too brown or too outspoken or too queer. Clara recognized that just as you can't judge a book by its cover, you cannot judge a person by their gender or their skin color or their age or any other such thing. Sometimes you really can trust people over 30. <laughs> you judge people by their actions and their ideas, what side they are on. About the woman lawyer on the other side of her discrimination case against City Light, Clara said in a talk, I fought for affirmative action, and now I am affirmatively oppressed. <laughs> As I have been thinking about this talk, it's been an interesting exercise to think about what Clara would make of the world 15 years on. In the same 1989 speech I just quoted, she also said, our lovely revolts, black, Chicano, feminist, Asian American, Native American, lesbian, gay, were these upsurges merely for the purpose of changing the race, sex, and sexuality of our oppressors? But isn't that what has happened? Again, that was Clara in 89. Um, well, okay, so one can only imagine what Clara would have to say about our first black president and our third female secretary of state conducting the longest running U.S. war in history while the administration deports more immigrants and locks up more youth of color than ever. She would certainly be appalled, but she would not be surprised. Many of us in this room can keenly remember times when we would go to Clara or Gloria with a tale of being wounded, really wounded, by some sellout or another, and the response would be, well, what did you expect? <laughs> On the other hand, there is much about the world today that would make Clara profoundly happy. Bradley Manning is an example. While there is certainly no joy to be found in his terrible persecution, the fact that he, a gay soldier, found the courage to expose the extreme war crimes of the US government is a testament to everything that Clara believed about the role of the most oppressed in society, including the armed forces. Because she was a, a genius at seeing the outlines of the future in the present moment, she even wrote a column anticipating Bradley Manning's role as whistleblower, which she called the love that dare not speak its name in the army. And there is a lot that has gone on in the party that she built that would also make her proud and happy. Our first national electoral campaign with a gay man and a Chicana, our videographer, <laughs> Stephen Durham and Christina Lopez running for president and vice president. What an ambitious endeavor. And we're all just still recovering a little bit. No. Um, and, 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 and this was so in keeping with what Clara believed about using the electoral arena to make political headway even as you make no concessions and 
expose the, the Democrat, uh, Republican, every four years circus for the fraud that it really is. And after all of Clara's experiences with the unfortunate group of leftists she called male Marxists with a Freudian hangover, <laughs> how glad she would be to know about the positive reaction that socialist feminism is now finding in Latin America. Although she joked about being an internationalist who had barely made it out of the US, she was an internationalist to her core. She would be delighted that FSP is working with women and men revolutionaries in Mexico and the Dominican Republic and Costa Rica who take our politics seriously, who agree with the need for feminism as a tie that binds as a basis for left recruitment. She would approve of our efforts to deepen the party's relationship with these comrades to the south methodically and on the basis of political program. She would be glad that the lesson she taught us, that no one gender, no one color, no one party, no one country makes revolution by themselves, that that lesson took hold and that we are doing our best to make it see fruit. Personally, I miss Clara. I miss editing her columns. She made writing them look so easy, even though, of course, I knew it wasn't so. I miss the critiques she brought not only to political projects, but to everyday things like going out to a restaurant for a meal or watching a video. So yes, I miss her. But I know that she did as much as any human being could have to provide us, all of us, not just her comrades, but everyone she came in contact with, with the tools that we need to go forward. The ideas, the organizations, the practical skills, even the socialist ethics. I want to close with a couple of lines from a 1978 piece that Clara authored with Susan Williams called Socialist Feminism, where the battle of the sexes resolves itself. After talking about a socialist philosophy and practice that ignores or sells out the most oppressed members of the working class, Clara and Susan wrote, the old decrepit highways of radical politics are obsolete. Socialist feminism is the swift moving freeway not so much like our Seattle freeways. <laughs> Socialist feminism is the swift moving freeway to world revolution and the road ahead promises new and higher relations between the sexes based on the triumph of human intelligence, generosity, and comradeship. That promise is still there and now it's up to us. <laughs> <laughs>